Okay, hello everyone. Um, I hope you can hear me uh, and that everything is working and that the uh, technology gods are on our side um, today. Um, my name is uh, Astrid Numelin Karlberg and I am Open Forum Europe's policy director. Open Forum Europe or OFE is a Brussels-based think tank uh, uh, working uh, at the intersection of open technologies and public policy. So welcome today uh, to our event on open source and smart cities. Um, this event is the first installment of the OFE open source uh, policy series, uh, during which we hope to offer deep dives um, into the most relevant topics in the area of open source, open technologies, and how they intersect with the uh, most pressing digital policy cha challenges facing Europe. So first of all, I'd like to uh, thank our series partner, the Eclipse Foundation, and our event sponsor, Red Hat, for helping us make this event uh, and the series happen at this exciting time for open technologies and public policy. So this policy series uh, follows uh, our EU Open Source Policy Summit, which took place in February, where uh, high-level policymakers such as European Commissioner Thierry Breton set uh, the scene for what is at stake. Uh, we will host six virtual event, events uh, during the spring and early summer. And during these, we will address the role of open technologies in, in crucial areas such as the European chip industry, green trans trans uh, transition, institutional capacity building, digital sovereignty, 5G, and the EU's uh, competitiveness. And uh, you know, I hope to see you at several, if not all of these events. So uh, just some quick housekeeping for today's event. Um, we want uh, these sessions to be a space for an open exchange. So, so we'll have a discussion and Q&A after the panelists' remarks. If you want to ask a question, please just write it in the chat and uh, the OFE team will bring it to the attention of the moderator. And uh, like all our activities, this exchange is covered by the OFE community participation guidelines, which you can find on our website. Um, but you know, simply put, just make sure to be uh, your most friendly self. Um, but today, my main job is really to, to introduce our moderator, Leslie Hawthorne. Uh, Leslie, uh, who is an American living um, in, in Europe uh, for, for several years, is the manager of vertical community strategy in Red Hat's open source program office, um, which is within the office of the CTO. There, she leads uh, the team responsible for shepherding community engagement around Red Hat's participation in open source and open standards projects. So this relates to verticals such as automotive, telecommunications, and the public sector. We wanted to have her involved as we know that her interest in smart cities goes beyond her professional commitments. Uh, she's had, uh, she has a deep personal desire to see the vision for a broadly connected civ uh, civic infrastructure manifest for all citizens um, and stakeholders, particularly more vulnerable uh, populations, including disabled persons and the elderly. And of course, to do so um, uh, in a fashion that respects privacy, citizen autonomy, all while delivering more sophisticated and accessible services. With this, uh, please, Leslie, the floor is yours and welcome all speakers. Thank you so much for the kind introduction, Aster. Good day and greetings to all of you who are joining us for today's exploration of open source, open standards, and how these two things can inform our understanding of the future smart cities. Uh, my thanks also to all of our esteemed panelists for being here today to share your wisdom and perspectives. Um, I think it is no great secret that the climate crisis is the greatest single threat facing humanity today. Uh, with our global populations expected to rise to 10 billion people by the year 2050, and 68% of the world's population therefore expected to be living in urban environments at that time, uh, these questions become ever more pressing to citizens, civic planners, and policymakers alike. Uh, how we architect our response to the climate crisis through conceptualizing and building out resilient, hyper-connected cities will play a large part in the needed response for us to all create a sustainable future together. We're convening today to explore some of the greatest challenges and opportunities facing policymakers. Questions such as how to architect our civic infrastructure with environmental sustainability at the top of mind, how we address the needs of our rapidly urbanizing population, 
how we can provide consistent and high quality services to citizens in a time of rapid digital transformation, and how to ensure that solutions in the smart city domain address these needs while maintaining adequate data protection and ensuring citizen sovereignty. Uh, based on our collective experience, it is the thesis of today's event organizers that we can create smart city solutions atop open source software and using open standards in order to produce the best possible outcomes for Europeans. The, through open source and open standards based solutions, smart city deployments can provide replicable models that will advance the state of the art within Europe and allow for wider sharing and repurposing of that time and work that has already been invested, allowing it to be adapted to the widest possible set of use cases. Uh, we further posit that the policy and technical work done within the European member states can serve as a reference model for similar work uh, that will be undertaken worldwide. Uh, the use of open source and open standards further underpins a key component of our current zeitgeist, the need to move through digital transformation in a manner that ensures that technology addresses concerns of privacy and citizen sovereignty via open, auditable, and transparent technology solutions, while also ensuring that the solutions that are chosen meet the ongoing needs of policymakers and civic planners who need to control their own destinies and choose the right solutions for their constituents now, but will also require these solutions to evolve, scale, and adapt depending on the future needs of citizens. Uh, we further note that it's not just the technical promises of open source software and open standards that will benefit Europeans, but the development processes and social learnings from the decades of work done to co-create these software and standards. Within the open source software and open standards communities, we can discover and take in a wealth of knowledge about how to work together across borders, political perspectives, and cultural norms. And as we continue our work to digitally transform citizen services in a rapid fashion, which as we all understand has been made all the more rapid by the pandemic, um, the principles that underpin open communities are all the more vital to our ongoing work. Transparency, security and audibility, repurposing and, and sharing in order to scale up and scale out, and also the need to meet constituents where they are in order to negotiate the best possible outcomes for everyone. Um, you'll learn in more detail from our esteemed panelists today that open source is already everywhere in the smart city arena. So it may seem surprising to focus so deeply on the role of open source and open standards in smart cities. But our discussion today is not just about the value of these as technical solutions. It is also our intention to focus on how open source and open standards contribute to positive externalities for local and national economies. Um, our, our kind hosts, Open Forum Europe, have in collaboration with the Newt Blind, uh, with Newt Blind from the Fraunhofer ISI, uh, conducted a study to get some numbers around these positive externalities. Uh, and these final results were presented at OFE's Open Source Policy Summit in February. Uh, but to, to briefly recap some highlights, research indicates that the economic value of open source software on the EU economy uh, is estimated to be between 65 and 95 billion euros in 2018 alone, and EU countries and EU located companies made significant investments into open source software of 1 billion euro in 2018. And if we consider that since this is, uh, pr these products are all available for reuse by both the public and private sector, uh, the estimates are that it would take 16,000 full-time developers to produce the same volume of, of code with its requisite contributions um, to the GDP of Europe. An increase of code contributions of 10% from these entities are estimated to generate an around additional Euro 100 billion of EU GDP per year. And this increase of 10% would likely generate an additional 1,000 ICT startups per year within the European Union. It is with these challenges and benefits as the backdrop of our discussion where we will now begin our panel with an exploration of the general principles and technologies associated with smart cities. Later, we'll move on to case studies from member states followed by open discussion amongst our panelists. So <clears throat> we will hear first today from Mr. Thomas Skordas, Director of Digital Excellence and Science Infrastructure at the Directorate General for Communication Networks, Content and Technology. Mr. Skordas joined the European Commission in 1995 and has worked in various units dealing with ICT research, ICT security, and trust. He has been a head of the unit of the Photonics Unit and the Flagships Unit, and since March of 2017 is a director at DG Connect. Mr. Skordas, thank you so much for joining us today. We look forward to your remarks. Thank you, Leslie, and good afternoon to all our audience. It's a pleasure to be here for this event. First time for me as a director responsible for 
the part of what we are doing in DigiConnect in the European Commission uh, for the Smart Cities and Smart Communities Initiative. So I'm relatively new in the domain, as you may understand. The unit is with me only very few months now, although it's a unit that we have been running for quite some time now. So you would certainly excuse me then if uh, I'm still in this steep learning phase about what we are doing, but not about what the policy areas are about, which I hope I will be able to explain to our audience today. Uh, so from that respect, uh, as you rightly said, we did this study that we um, uh, commissioned some time ago on the area of open source, uh, open standards, etc. And as you have uh, very, very well highlighted, uh, the um, uh, we have seen with a lot of pleasure how much it has been expanding since its creation. I think it's more than 20 years that I remember that we started the discussions in the union about the open source software movement, eh? so Linux and the rest. So it's a real pleasure to see now how much these uh, initial steps have now become a concrete initiative, how much it, it affects now directly the uh, European economy and the European society. And it's also, uh, I would say, um, that uh, from a public administration perspective, although we are agnostic, of course, into specific technologies and specific aspects of technology, we're not agnostic when we see how much this is coming in in the different areas be it in the public administration, be it in smart cities, be it as you highlighted, or be it in any other area where it makes a lot of sense. And I think one of the things that the study has highlighted also is uh, um, that there are many use cases where the public sector at all levels uh, uh, is, is depending now on open source policies because it allows benefits are multiple as the study has shown. So it's not only about uh, uh, the issue of, uh, I would say, open source software, but in particular, it is about reducing the total cost of ownership by procuring uh, uh, OSS-related um, software. It is by reducing, of course, or even avoiding vendor lock-in, and it's also by promoting really an innovation, if you wish, an ecosystem where there is competition and where we see it thriving out there, and I think it's very, very much related also, and it goes really into the direction we want to promote in the Union about the European values, uh, which are behind, because this is exactly what we see coming in. Not any more dependence on the big software vendors that we know very, very well coming from the different areas of the, uh, uh, of, of the world, but really a new, um, I would say, movement that can facilitate our way towards all, all this open, transparent and other issues that you have so well highlighted. This being said, the study itself is not making a very, very clear link between open standards, open source software and the cities, which is uh, the, uh, uh, I would say, the, the topic of today. Of course, many cities use OSS, use open standards. I mean, uh, the examples are numerous, so I would not like to uh, go through them. But I think uh, a little bit to reposition uh, the whole discussion, I mean, at least from my introductory perspective, I think what is important here is to highlight that for us, smart cities and smart communities is part of the digital transformation, uh, the two main uh, priorities of this commission, which is the Green Deal and the digital. And I think this is exactly what we can see in the smart cities of the future, or even of today, is the combination of the two that would make things change in the future. It is the combination, it's the digital platforms open to a large extent that would thrive also the move or that will prepare the move to uh, uh, green cities of the future. This is our target, as you know, to have many green cities by 2030, I will come back to that. And uh, one essential mechanism to achieve it is really the story of the digital uh, platforms that are behind. It's the story of open data. It's the story of uh, going ahead with the principles that are all our principles, that is providing equal opportunities for all and hearing what our cities are saying and hearing what our citizens are saying. I think this is exactly the kind of vision that we have tried to promote uh, in the kind of communication which we call digital decade. You know, just a few days ago, actually it was last Tuesday, that we had a communication on what would be the main digital targets until 2030. And smart cities and communities are figuring there. And I think the vision is a common vision for all of us. So green, digital, 
There is nothing else. And uh, a, a digital transformation that is bringing the citizens on board. Because what we would like to do is the European way, that is making sure that we are working with our citizens, for our citizens, to promote platforms that would be, uh, you know, stimulating the kind of new services and the kind of new environmental aspects that we will see for the future. I think this is some notes just for the introduction to the subject. Thank you. while also pairing it with the need to, to work directly hand in hand with citizens and to make sure that this is a, an exercise in their empowerment and enfranchisement. Um, I appreciate that. We're going to move on to the introductory remarks for our next panelist now, and we'll come back with questions later on in the panel. Uh, well, welcome next to the screen, Mr. Ulrich Al, the Chief Executive Officer of the Fiwar Foundation. Um, following on his extensive experience in the industrial sector, including time as Vice President and Leader of Manufacturing, Retail, and Transportation Consulting and Systems Integration at Atos, Germany. Uh, he's now helping clients uh, to digitize their, oh, he was helping clients to digitize their business then and then joined the Fiwar Foundation in September of 2016. Uh, he currently serves on the Board of Directors of International Data Spaces Association and was on the board of ProStep IVIP Association for 16 years before he then became an honorary member in 2019. Thank you so much for joining us today, Mr. Al. We look forward to your remarks. Yeah, Leslie, uh, thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, panel. A very good afternoon uh, or a very good evening, wherever you uh, listen to us here uh, on the world. And uh, Leslie, you said uh, there is a clear trend for further urban urbanization. And uh, it is uh, expected that by 2050, more than two thirds of the world population will live in cities. And um, I also um, agree with Thomas that uh, digitization will definitely help us to achieve the sustainable development goals, not only the number 11, which is smart cities itself, but also several other uh, of these uh, 17 uh, goals in total. So digital and green fit together, Thomas, as you uh, definitely said. And this is one of the reasons why um, the European Commission started already 10 years ago to create in a public-private partnership the Fiverr Foundation or the Fiverr Technology, the Fiverr Ecosystem. At that time, it was called the Future Internet PPP, a public-private partnership. And uh, this is the FI in Fiverr, so the Future Internetware. And as I said, it started um, back in 2011. And it, at that time, it was not clear that it will create uh, really one of uh, Europe's largest open source ecosystems. Um, for the first two years, open source was not given. And then the Commission decided in 2013 that the results of this program, and in total, roughly 500 million euro were spent into this uh, PPP of public funding, of private uh, funding in there. And uh, that was a moment in time when some large companies left this PPP because at that time they were not ready for open source. Um, three large European companies and one American headquartered company which was involved um, with uh, European operations into this PPP. And I don't want to mention these names uh, now because they definitely changed their position on uh, open source. And some of them are heavily supporting now um, the creation of um, open source. And uh, to bring all this um, investment and the technology into a sustainable future, the Fiverr Foundation was created um, four years ago, end of 2016, headquartered in Berlin. And uh, I had the honor to uh, take over the responsibility for the Fiverr ecosystem, which was created by the Commission and is now self-sustainable. And uh, back in, in March uh, 2017, so exactly four years ago, um, we had a, an event in Brussels the Fiverr Open Day, and I took over the baton from, uh, from Piers O'Donoghue, who was uh, so far driving this initiative. And Thomas, I think uh, Piers is a colleague of your 
in the in the directorate age i think yeah um and since that uh, the five foundation was really growing um with a global presence and in the meantime in the domain of smart cities fiverr is the globally leading open source technologies far more than 200 cities in more than 30 countries are creating their smart cities based on fiverr technology so what is fiverr it is pure open source technology we as foundation we are providing open source software building blocks we are not providing complete five um, smart city solutions so from for example no smart city platforms no smart parking solutions smart waste management we are just providing the ingredients to build such solutions which are built either by the end users directly if they have sufficient know-how capacity and competence or by partners out of the ecosystem which are using this software building blocks which are using the standard architecture which are using the standard apis and um, these apis and this one api which was developed uh, in the fiverr ecosystem it is called uh, next generation service interface ngsi it became in the meantime not only a de facto standard it became a formal standard standardized by etsy which is one of the three global uh, three uh, european standardization bodies and it is now the standard for data management within smart cities so and the uh, fourth and final ingredient we are providing are standard data models um, here we joined forces with a global organization called um, tm forum um, to initiate the creation of smart and standard data models in the meantime more than 300 different areas where we have created the standards um, a lot of them in uh, smart cities but also in agriculture in energy in industry um, to further increase the replicability um, of uh, smart solutions and um, this helps us to avoid the so-called vendor lock-in effect for the end users by using open source based solutions but also open standards open interfaces open data models open source in this combination it is possible to provide the lowest cost of ownership and also to um, avoid a vendor lock in effect um if you uh, give two uh -huh. more minutes two or three more minutes uh leslie would that be okay yeah um I'll just I will find my mute button. Absolutely. Two more minutes would be perfectly fine. Thank you. Please continue. Okay. okay. Uh, and let me let me tell you a story um, from India. Uh, India started um, when Prime Minister Modi was elected for the first time in 2014 with the 100 Smart Cities program, investing several billion US dollar or transferred to rupees but that figure would be even higher um, into this program. Um, a lot of global consulting companies help the cities to create their smart city strategy, to bring first tenders to the market, uh, guided the implementation of first projects. And two years ago, the Indian government identified each city has built its own silo. The wheel has been invented several times and there are only very little synergies between this 100 smart cities. Knowing that there are another 4,300 big cities in India, you know, India is three times bigger than Europe. Um, they decided two years ago to change strategy and started the implementation of what is now called the India Urban Data Exchange Platform using Fiverr standard APIs, using Fiverr, originally Fiverr um, data models. Now this IODX program joined the Smart Data Models Initiative and also using open source technology, partly from Fiverr, but also from uh, other open source communities. And on February 23rd of this year, so um, yeah, three weeks ago, the Minister for Housing and Urban Affairs and the Minister for Technology both publicly announced the availability 
of this standard smart city platform for India. It has been rolled out already to the first 10 pilot cities. And here, India is defining not only open source as a basis for their smart cities, but also um, open APIs and open data models. And we have a sister organization, a close partner organization called the Open and Agile Smart Cities. And here, these two elements are called MIM1 and MIM2, the minimum interoperability mechanism. And I'm just coming out of um, the um, uh, Smart Cities Working Group within Gaia-X. This is um, headed by uh, Slovenia, um, by the ICT Academy of uh, the Chamber of Commerce in Slovenia. And um, also in Slovenia, this MIM1 and MIM2 has now been uh, adopted. And uh, uh, this is my vision for the adoption of open source technology also in Europe for smart cities, not only to have it based on open source, but using also open standards for interfaces, open standards for data models to further increase the replicability of solutions and to be able to exchange know-how and solutions and to avoid the vendor lock-in effect. And all of this based in the future on Gaia-X, so a, a federated cloud infrastructure based on European values. Uh, this is uh, a picture a vision we will work on uh, during the next years. Um, and this will definitely help us. I'm pretty sure about this. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was the best extra two minutes we've ever had uh, on any panel that I've ever participated in. Uh, and I really appreciate you bringing uh, to the discussion not just the importance of open source software and open standards, but also of open data models to make sure that all of the information mm -hmm. that these systems are producing is is widely applicable and usable across uh, many problem areas and breaking down those silos uh, that uh, stop these kinds of uh, smart city deployments from actually taking place. Uh, we'll move on to our next panelist and come back to you during uh, the questions at the conclusion of the panel. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. And we welcome next Mr. Peter Gertzak, the Secretary of the Min and Ministry of Public Administration at the, gov the Government of Slovenia. Mr. Gertzak has a background in industry at companies such as Oracle, IBM, and 3Gen, where he gained expertise and insight in areas such as cloud computing, data science, artificial intelligence, cybersecurity, and enterprise blockchain. He has also served as a member of the supervisory board at the Ljubljana University Incubator until 2020 and joined the Ministry of Public Administration as State Secretary and ICT Solutions Expert on the 28th of April, 2020. Thank you so much for joining us today, Mr. Gershak. We're looking forward to your remarks. Thanks for inviting me, Leslie and uh, everybody. Um, do you hear me? Yes? Okay, good. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, dear participants of the webinar, it's an honor for me to participate uh, at today's event. Uh, which addresses very, very important issues of digitalization and uh, smart cities. Uh, so we all know that for a while, the sustainable cities and communities are now only solution for containing and reducing the alarming env environmental and socio-economic uh, consequences that urbanization will have for our planet. As my previous, uh, our previous speaker said, how many people will live in a in a very near future in the cities. This is staggering uh, numbers. So we have to uh, work on that. And smart cities are actually uh, the answer to that. So the fact is that widespread use of digital technologies makes the cities and communities smart and more efficient. With connected intelligent systems, uh, they actually contribute to economic activities, improve citizen satisfaction, uh, with public services, uh, enhance public security, safety, it improves the sustainable environmental management, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I don't need to, 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 to count this, yeah? So in a nutshell, uh, the substantially improve the quality of our lives, and that's actually important to us, yeah, as a, as a user. So allow me now to make a helicopter view on the European Union and, uh, and Slovenia. So a global look at the uh, smart cities uh, and communities make this clear that the European Union puts human well-being at the at the very top, at the, at the, actually at the center. Yeah, and this is this is great for us. Yeah, 
Uh, and as you might know, in 2016, the European Commission issued a document blueprint for cities and regions and as a launch pad for digital transformation. Yeah? And the blueprint sets the concepts of how to establish an ecosystem of smart cities, since it touches all segments of the research sector, economy, human resources, competences, to infrastructure and, and capital. So various associations have been established, such as Open Agile Smart Cities, uh, et cetera, and also projects uh, like uh, Wi-Fi for Europe and Fiverr ensure a high level of privacy protection and civil liberties. So now a few words about uh, Slovenia. We are one of the most dispersed and sparsely populated countries in European Union with mainly rural environment. With this kind of dispersed population, it is harder to make cities and villages smarter. However, it is our goal to make our communities smart just as well. We believe that it's government's uh, duty to build the ecosystem of partners and to provide a framework for development, set standards and main guidelines within which stakeholders can develop smart solutions. Uh, last year, we made an analysis on the country level of digitalization of our municipalities. We found out that most investments were in the management of infrastructure and energy efficiency of buildings. Municipalities use different types of smart meters, water level sensors, water consumption sensors, traffic measurements, etc. with simple applications logic. Yeah? So these kind of examples are found everywhere especially in the major cities where introduction of smart city concepts and uh, individual silo solutions began to, to, to develop. Um, even though these stakeholders have been including digitalization into their operations and infrastructure management, optimization, communication with users and citizens for some time now, the analysis of uh, uh, the state of digitalization of our municipalities mentioned earlier helped us to recognize the biggest inhibitor to future digitalization of municipalities. And this is exactly the lack of integrated solutions. So there are silos, yeah? You would probably agree with me that the smart, yeah, smart is an integrating silo solutions in these days, yeah? Integrating silo solutions, their data, where they reside, where are generated into, uh, in silo solutions so to integrate this, and put smart logic on top of uh, these silos. And this actually makes cities, villages, communities, municipalities, whatever we name it, smart. Um, you can imagine that a tourist comes to Slovenia and has to download their uh, the application in each municipality in order to get key information. That's, that's not how, how it should be. Yeah? So we realize this fact um, and we wanted the Slovenian municipalities to unify their solutions in terms of data opening and also interoperability. Uh, that's why this February, uh, our ministry, Ministry of uh, Public Administration, published an invitation uh, to tender uh, for the consortium of municipalities. And the aim of the tender is to give the municipalities an opportunity to use advanced digital technologies and establish smart ecosystems and smart solutions in the areas of infrastructure. So we defined six areas actually, uh, infrastructure, care for environment, so in green, uh, health, transport, culture, sport, tourism, and security. So uh, within this unified approach, we want to ensure the interoper interoperability, as I already mentioned, of the solutions and the use of the same data model and, and open started standards. So within this standard, we are also facilitating the smart cities solutions ecosystem. We would like that companies which are looking to partner with uh, municipalities to develop their smart solutions together with municipalities. Yeah, and, and, and to these companies, the opportunity is given of getting the reference projects, which then can help them to get business also elsewhere in other countries or in other municipalities or in other with other companies or cities or whatever. Yeah. So smart solutions created by the municipalities will consume data, and that's the second point here, but at the same time uh, will also yeah, produce the data, but uh, at the same time, we would like that companies uh, that also this, sorry, that this, also this uh, 
um, small solutions and the municipalities are sending this data, maybe aggregated or not, uh, to, to our servers where we will expose them via Fever, via Context Broker uh, as open data. So that this ecosystem can even benefit more and create even um, smarter solutions on top of the this data. Um, so similar solution, but it, but uh, we can say it is more uh, static data, state, static uh, data we already have in place. If we say that this data will be more fluid, yeah. And this, what we have in place is the is called Slovenian Open Data Hub, which integrates business, state, and innovation companies in facilitating to produce new innovative solutions. So there you can find uh, different data sets where you can take and you and create whatever smart algorithms and logic on top of this. Um, and I'm saying it's static, static because uh, they are not changed frequently every day, yeah? but they are these sets of data which are regularly changed and updated. But with uh, smart city solutions, we would like that this flow of data is happening, you know, actually more or less on the fly into our servers. Um, so um, in in, in, the, in the perspective, in the look forward, um, what what we are planning? So this will this uh, we are planning uh, to 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 go forward uh, with our work on on smart cities and communities uh, to put funds into recovery and resilience facility, and also to new cohesion fund. Uh, so where we are actually intending to co-finance smart cities in terms of. Uh, yeah, facilitating solutions, uh, smart solutions. Um, there will be quite substantial amount of grants and repayable, repayable funds for these solutions. Uh, but of course, you know, this is in in, in the final stage. We know for uh, RRF, it is in final stages somewhere. This this uh, first half of the year to be approved, and for to cohesion fund also in 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 the next uh, probably quarters. Yeah um so probably you would agree with me that a solution whatever smart it is uh, cannot help citizens if they are not ready to accept and use it so all stakeholders needs to be involved into digitalization process and um for me since i also know a little bit about uh, design thinking I think that especially important uh, are the end users, which they need to be all the time with when developing a solution. Um, and we need to create the, the, the best possible user experience for, for them. Um, so I can, um, Leslie, do we still have two minutes or, or no? Yes, absolutely, please continue. Yes. So then I will just uh, guide you very, very briefly through the initiative which Slovenia is taking uh, into, into smart uh, cities um, area. Uh, and that's, uh, it's, we are, we have three consortiums uh, which are supported by Intelligent Cities uh, Challenge. They are preparing a long-term strategy for digitalization of municipalities. Then the second one is this public tender. I, I mentioned for, these are demonstration projects for the establishment of smart cities and communities and then we are planning in rrf we are planning the monetization of this uh of this uh, demonstration project yeah uh then the third one is actually the national declaration for accelerating digital transformation of towns villages and communities into the sustainable smart smart um, society and that's actually, we have Slovenian Digital Coalition, uh, which is working with uh, on Slovenian National Declaration. And actually, the objective is what I mentioned, uh, accelerating the, the, the transformation of cities, villages, and communities. Then we have, I mentioned already, Open Data Hub, which we are aiming to, 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 to um, enlarge it with this uh, liquid, uh, on-the-fly flow of data from smart uh, city solutions. Uh, and um, Open Data Hub actually is the uh, is the 
three main actors are here. Uh, so state, government, uh, um, com companies, and and innova innovative uh, innovation. So uh, academia and so on. Um, then, yeah, um, we have agreement on joint efforts to standardize content data models. This is local. We already have standardized uh, on Slovenian level, for example, e invoices, which is like 15 years already, and it's it's great. Um, yeah, then I mentioned Fiverr, uh, bi uh, platform building blocks like Content Broker, Context Broker. Um, then we um, are using OAC data models. And what Ulrich mentioned, yes, we support uh, MIME 1 and MIME 2, uh, or minimum uh, interoperability mechanisms. So that's that's the main uh, areas where, where we are working. And of course, we are uh, planning to extend this in the future because we think that smart city, smart community is very, it's the future actually. Yeah. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, I, I firmly believe that the states can participate and in development of smart cities by encouraging investments, co-financing with grants, repayable funds, uh, the ecosystem, and with the infusion of some degree of coordination between regions, municipalities, and cities. I thank you very much. There will be also questions in the future, and I wish you a fruitful uh, discussion. Thank you. Back to you, Leslie. Thank you so much. We really appreciate your remarks, and I particularly appreciate your touching on the points of the need for there to be collaboration and co-creation between the folks who are creating smart city solutions, not just with the municipalities that they're creating them for, but with the end users of these systems to keep their needs at the front of mind. Thank you so much. We'll uh, get back to you during the question period later on in the panel. And folks, we're going to now turn to our uh, final panelist, Mr. Pedro Viana who is head of the Digital Transformation Department at the Administrative Modernization Agency, IP Portugal. Mr. Viana has a background in business and startups, has co-authored a book on digital transformation, and has worked in digital procurement at the National Public Procurement Agency. Thank you so much for joining us today, Mr. Viana, who may be hiding in the wings of our fabulous video conferencing platform. I'll just give him a moment to join. If my fine friends with OFE who are uh, staffing can let me know in the chat. Hi, Pedro. It's good to see that you're there. I'll be happy to wait for you to join me. Hi, this is Astro from OFE. I don't know if you can hear me. I can. Thank you. Yeah, OK, perfect. Uh, just one second. We seem to have a little bit of a connection issue. It seemed to work again. Uh, it worked earlier. so so. Uh, just a minute, and we, we should sort this out. Yeah, well, absolutely be patient. Uh, unfortunately, folks, I have not prepared any excellent um, humorous filler material for the inevitable technical glitch, okay. but it doesn't matter because here is Pedro <laughs> to join us. Hello, Mr. Viana. Thank you so uh, much for joining us. Thank you very much for, 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 the, for being on this uh, event, uh, for being invited to share. Uh, and I, I think. Um, Open source uh, is about sharing and uh, building upon what exists and improving the solutions that are in place. So, uh, uh, having said that, uh, uh, it's very hard to build upon the excellent interventions from my colleagues uh, without, without repeating uh, the, um, the major topics. but. I'll try to to give something new and innovative uh, point of view. But uh, in reality, I think uh, being the last, uh, it has the advantage. Perhaps I can sum up a little bit. So uh, we, all of us, have been there. No? We invested in some kind of smart cities before. We found out that these are not the smart cities that we aim for, and. Uh, uh, and now we are looking to smart cities that are not only digital, that are also for citizens, that are also respecting environmental and sustainable values. And, and, and this is one of the things that I find, I find it's, it's common on the, the previous speeches. 
And uh, the other thing is that uh, we have to share. Uh, and uh, in this regard, this is much what we are trying to do here in, in Portugal. Uh, we have learned that uh, putting money uh, would create silos. We have these silos, these smart cities. We have smart cities that are uh, very developed, other ones that are only a promise, and several levels of uh, capacity for implementing smart cities. But our vision is that we, we have to put in place uh, uh, a way to not only create smart cities, uh, the silos, but to create smart regions, smart nation, a smart nation. Uh, we, we believe in Portugal that the future will bring us more, uh, will bring us for, uh, more for uh, 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 a government or uh, government services that are provided by the local authorities in proximity, knowing the difficulties on, on the populations or the challenges they have had. So uh, we, we find that uh, HEMA, uh, the Administrative Modernization Agency, although it's a central entity from the public center, uh, we find that it's very important to provide the building blocks we developed for the central public sector also to the, to the um, uh, local administration. And uh, being able to provide a, a seamless services where the, the, the citizen or the business doesn't have to know uh, who is providing the service or it's not having very different uh, user experiences when doing, uh, getting the services. So uh, this is the reason we are now doing a, a new strategy, a new plan for the few, uh, for following years, uh, where this part of the values, the sustainability, the sharing will be, will take main, main stage, okay? And uh, where we can build these smart nations, not because sometimes we'll, we find that the smart city is a, a very nice concept, but for instance, uh, when we are talking about big cities, at least in Portugal, big cities are surrounded by other cities that are also big cities. And if we don't share information, data flows, processes, we'll not be able to take advantage on, 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 the, um, on this transformation, on this smart. And uh, in, in this regard, we are, like uh, Peter said before, we are investing very much in interoperability, creating interoperable cities where information, where services can flow, not only inside the cities, but also among the other cities. The cities. And um, where data from one city can be very helpful, for instance, as open data or not open data, uh, to uh, the other city, for instance. Uh, 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 there is an, a clear example in, in, in Portugal, the, the city I live in. It's a city where uh, we have mainly businesses, uh, uh, but people live elsewhere. But these people that live elsewhere, they travel every day to this city. So, uh, not having information on how is the traffic, how are the weather conditions? If there is any problem with the with the road infrastructure or with transportation, it can play a very big role on managing the city. So, uh, what will happen today? You know, it's almost a, uh, uh, what will happen as a miracle today because something anything will happen on these cities that are working together. So, and and this is the the, the reason we are. Uh, enforcing or trying to promote because we cannot enforce from the point uh, or point of view of the public sector central public sector we cannot enforce a, a local administration to use the same building blocks but we are trying to promote the usage of these same building blocks creating these uh, workflows that will work for them and will work also not only between cities but between cities and the government and central government uh, and this is the, the, the challenge because in the past we put together uh, common rules, uh, norms, uh, standards, 
that are uh, mandatory for everyone. We have different kinds of uh, adhesion. Some of these municipalities use the norms, the, the same norms, other they don't use. And what we have to do now is to, to make sure that we are speaking, we are inter interoperable. And this is the challenge, the main challenge we have for, for the future in Portugal and that we are aiming to tackle with this uh, new strategy for the following years. Mm -hmm. Excellent, thank you so much. We appreciate the remarks. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to invite all of our panelists uh, back on screen so that we can go through some time for Q&A, please. And we'll just give a moment for that to happen. Welcome back, Ulrich. Welcome back, Thomas. And I believe we're just waiting for a moment on Peter. And there we go. Welcome back, Peter. Gentlemen, thank you again for all of your uh, remarks today and for sharing your wisdoms and perspectives. Um, I'm just gonna go ahead and jump into uh, some questions for each of you, but I would love it if anyone on the panel would like to, to share their thoughts and experience after the main questioner provides their remarks. Um, so if we could start with you, please, uh, Mr. Escortes, how do smart cities fit into the EU recovery budget plan? Hmm. Well, uh, from I think we had already some very good examples that were provided by uh, 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 Peter today, how they fit. They are one of the, uh, I would say, areas where we would like really uh, the, uh, the member states to invest. Don't forget that the level of investment that we have foreseen is 670 something billion euros over the next uh, uh, five and a half to six years until end 2026 as part of this resilience and recovery package. 20% on digital, 37% or close to 40% on green. You combine both and you have already a huge way of uh, uh, ideas that you can put in place for moving into the area of smart cities and communities. So uh, frankly, while we are promoting the field and I think we have many cities that are part of the different movements that we have in Europe, the level of investment we see right now in the um, packages that we have received so far is uh, a little bit lower than what I would uh, have expected. So it is an issue for us. Maybe if I can uh, say it like this, we see that in the north we don't have too much, uh, too many investments on uh, smart cities and communities today. Maybe because they are a little bit more developed than in the south, where indeed many of the uh, plans include the smart cities and communities. We have heard from Slovenia. I'm pretty sure that uh, uh, Portugal is preparing also something which is very, very concrete. I know about, about my country in Greece that uh, indeed we have exactly similar discussions as uh, some of the issues that have been highlighted here. Uh, the same applies for Cyprus. So you see that the South is now mobilizing itself uh, a little bit more than the North. <laughs> but I'm pretty sure that the reality is that here we have to have a very good way of exchanging best practices and best practices are existing everywhere today in Europe. So uh, my point is somehow different here. It's that we have cities that are laggards that have not even started you know, going into the area of smart cities. So convincing mayors, convincing cities that this is the future is not a big deal, but giving them concrete plans on how to do it from A to Z, this is the challenge. Uh, the second category of cities we have is cities that have started playing with the notions of smart cities and with the notion of data and interoperability, open standards, I think uh, the speakers have already mentioned, but they need now more concrete ways of moving ahead. And this is what we are more or less preparing now a little bit is how can we help all collectively, you know, from a European perspective, help these cities move into their green procurements, into their procurements of digital platforms in the future. And the third perspective is, of course, all the more advanced cities. I think they exist everywhere around. And uh, I think that the big trend there is not just open data, interoperability, etc. I think they moved beyond that. And we see that the future is about these are kinds of digital twins. We call them local digital twins, interoperable digital twins, 
that are powered by AI, that are powered by open data approaches, and where we can combine many of those to be able to create a picture, uh, a, a, sim a modeling and simulation picture of how our green cities would look like. And this is exactly one of the areas where we would like the, uh, the member states to move. So by replicating good examples everywhere, by interconnecting data, by interconnecting platforms that we are developing, by creating a toolbox, if you wish, where of existing services that they can reuse, rather than uh, create a starting again from scratch. The Indian example that Ulrich mentions is exactly, I would say, the good example not to replicate in Europe. So, and this is exactly the field where we'd like the cities and our member states to move. So probably with some uh, more than demo projects in one or two areas, one, two big cities that could start from, and then we could replicate those examples everywhere. So that's a little bit the idea. Uh, and uh, I would like also to come to another thing in RRFs that we see right now. Actually, we see the same also on the uh, uh, regional funds because this is the other uh, essential element where many budget, where many funds would come. And again, we heard it coming also from the Slovenian colleague. I think what is absolutely funda uh, fundamental here is uh, to have the citizens as part of the initiative. I would not consider them just you know, end users, but citizens that need to co-design with the developers from the very beginning, the kinds of platforms they want to see, you know, they, that they understand from the very beginning, where do we go, uh, where, how do we go there, and how can citizens be part of this co-design approach to develop not only the open platforms, but to develop also the services, the digital twins, if you wish, that they would like to see for the future of these green and digital cities. So these are the fundamental, I would say, challenges that we want to see in the RRF plans and in the uh, regional plans and cohesion plans for the next six, seven years. Mm -hmm. um, Leslie, may I add uh, a view from a bit more northern part of Europe? Please do. <laughs> um, uh, uh, Germany is not really northern Europe, um, but um, looking at Germany, um, and that this is really strange because Germany is one of the leading countries when it comes to digitization of manufacturing processes. You know, Industry 4.0 has been invented in Germany. Uh, but when it comes to digitization of public processes, and there's this famous DAISY report from the European Commission, uh, Germany is actually on position 22 of the European countries. And there are not too many countries behind Germany. So... Um, uh, there are, and especially southern European countries, but also countries like Finland and, and Estonia, they are five years ahead of Germany when it comes to digitization of public processes, when it comes to smart cities. And this was identified by the German government, and they put out of the German recovery fund, which was already released in June of last year, another 500 million euro into the smart cities program in Germany, which is called Smart Cities Made in Germany. So it is clear Germany has to speed up when it comes to smart cities, uh, but uh, the programs are in place and uh, Germany is really learning also from other countries and the, the German cities are learning from cities in other more advanced countries when it comes to digitization of, uh, of cities. Thank you. Would anyone else like to make remarks on this topic? Okay, um, then I'm going to uh, jump to a question actually from our audience, particularly since it came up in the, Mr. Scordis's remarks on digital twins. Uh, the, uh, the audience members are interested in knowing of uh, some examples of how digital can be used to make smart cities more green. And I'm happy for anyone to answer that, although I, I may call on Ulrich for this one as our fireware yeah, expert. Maybe. Maybe um, to give you an example, and uh, this is also one uh, of the most used uh, vertical solutions based on an uh, open data platform in cities or based on a smart city platform, not only for Fiverr, but also for other technologies, be it open source or be it closed source, and that's smart parking. And uh, in a lot of European cities, um, up to 30% of the inner city traffic is traffic searching for free parking lots. And if we are able to use digital uh, solutions to guide the driver to his or her, not to uh, guide the driver to his or her target destination, and then 
ask the driver to look for free parking space around, but directly to guide the person to the next, to the closest free parking lot, according to the preferences of the person. Cheapest parking, shortest way uh, or shortest distance to my target destination, then we can avoid a lot of this uh, traffic searching for uh, free parking lots, avoid a lot of uh, air uh, pollution which is created and uh, waste of time and waste of energy um, when uh, driving through the city searching for free parking lots. And another um, example uh, to make cities greener is the topic of smart lighting, a very popular uh, vertical solution because changing from traditional lamps to LED as such is saving 70% of the energy, energy consumption and then making street lights even intelligent, being able to dim down and only shine bright when the light is required. So for example, a street light is identifying a bicycle which is passing by, shining up, telling the next street light already, hey, there is a bicycle coming, please shine up. And when the light is not required, it dims down again and serves, saves another 15% of energy. And uh, these are two simple examples, and there are dozens of others, how uh, digitization could help to make cities greener. Thank you. Would anyone else like yeah, to compliment maybe for Please? a couple of others? I think I fully agree with Ulrich. I mean, I remember that in 2008, 2009, we were working already uh, in the uh, in the union to provide good examples of smart lighting, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and at that moment we were at the very beginning. Unfortunately, Europe lost the battle of the uh, uh, LEDs produced in Europe, as you know perfectly well. Yep. And most of the solutions are now, are now coming from some uh, some cheaper countries <laughs> in the Far East or elsewhere. So uh, uh, and uh, this is really a pity. But nevertheless, I fully agree that. This is the way to go, and uh, we need now to uh, multiply these good examples. Just to give a couple of others, of course, the notion of smart breeds and uh, uh, and uh, uh, smart buildings uh, are even innovating massively our cities from the point of view of buildings would help uh, moving really to much more uh, energy uh, uh, preservation and understanding that massively how it can be done with an intelligent way is an important issue. Just to give you an example, when we build a digital twin of a building, this is something that exists uh, since several years now, but when you integrate in this digital twin of a building, also the different models, which are about uh, waste management, which are about uh, materials you use, which are about construction issues, etc., etc. you can stimulate, simulate actually, how much of the uh, um, energy that you're producing in the building becomes, uh, you know, wasted and you can then think about refurbishing buildings. Of course, by introducing also the notion of producing energy at the building level and therefore managing that energy for the building purposes. So these are some uh, small examples of uh, where we will certainly go just at the level of a building, you can imagine now at the level of whole city where you need to do something similar and um, you need to find out how you can do that massively and with the level of investments that we need to think about. Another issue which is absolutely very important also is understanding traffic pollution. Understanding, I mean, Ulrich said it a little bit, but it goes about the uh, managing the traffic uh, um, in the city and uh, in the peripheries of the city. You can think about where can you create new routes where do you want to deviate? Where would be the areas where you have very polluted areas and therefore you have to green them in one way or another? Where would you transform your planning of the city to be able to create new you know, uh, areas where it needs to become more green, et cetera? And what would be the consequences on the, on the life of the cities, on uh, the traffic of the cities, et cetera? All these are things, new things, new elements that are coming up uh, relatively quickly and we want to see in the next 10 years so as part of greening our city's environment you know just to mention a few excellent thank you so much um if we if, if you gentlemen don't mind i'd like to to change gears a bit uh, away from sort of the the technical and implementation details of some of our smart city opportunities and, and shift back to remarks on policy uh in particular this uh, question is from mr gershak uh, as uh, Slovenia is entering into the EU presidency, can you tell us more about how smart cities will play in into the agenda? 
Okay, thank you. Do you hear me? Absolutely. I need to check <laughs> that I will not speak uh, in vain. Okay, yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, we are really, we will take presidency from uh, Portugal colleagues, yeah, in the second half of the year, yeah. And um, so what, what we learned from this uh, analysis we did last year, actually two years ago, no, last year, um, municipalities and smart cities in Slovenia, they don't introduce uh, digitalization systematically. And they often lack um, strategy, long-term strategy, short-term strategy. And that actually reduces the, the, the potential for digitalization, yeah? Um, so because of that reason, uh, we will put emphasis uh, during the presidency on promoting the cooperation at the regional levels and at the level of municipalities uh, within similar challenges and similar digital um, maturity. Uh, to have to to enable this knowledge uh, flow, knowledge transfer, and with uh, some international, with some conferences, we will uh, try also to get this knowledge transfer uh, from different countries to different countries. Yeah. Um, so we will also during the presidency we will also highlight. Uh, uh, digitalization with special emphasis on artificial intelligence. We all know, we all know that the uh, AI is actually fundamental uh, to create a logic for the SWART, yeah? Um, we are right now working on the digital, digital twin of the state. Um, where we, where it, well, there are, there are quite a few uh, problems with getting the data, even even if the data are aggregated, yeah, they still are not anonymization. We know it's it's past, it's pseudonymization now. So there are quite a big concerns then about um, that from the aggregated data we could get to the real persons, yeah. So this is a main challenge, I would say, we are tackling here. But we have some sets of data where we could uh, predict uh, uh, and create a digital twin in some certain areas of for the for the for the for the country yeah for the state um so and also topics like um introduction of the advanced technology into the society and the transition to gigabit society will be also uh, important uh, for for the presidency cybersecurity um so we are planning the several events uh you know, during this COVID-19 pandemic, um, mostly virtual, but some hybrid as well. Um, and artificial intelligence will be like, uh, you know, red tape uh, during the, the, and smart cities during the, these events. Uh, so uh, in, in uh, July, it is quite early during the presidency, it will, it will be July the 8th. Uh, we will hold conference, um, on the EU as a community of people um, with focus on cross-border cooperation, uh, which is not so much digital, yeah, but the, the second uh, uh, stream will be smart cities and communities. Um, and this will be pure virtual event, yeah. Okay. Uh, so then in September, in September we'll name September month of artificial intelligence. Um, maybe you know that um, Slovenia has the largest number uh, AI scientists uh, per capita on the world. Uh, so we are quite, uh, you know, in a small country, we are quite in the topic of AI. So we would like to boost it, yeah, and make even more awareness about it. Uh, of course, with the uh, with, uh, with, uh, aspects also of ethics and human rights on, 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 on AI, yeah. But... There will be several events and activities uh, organized uh, through Slovenia on AI. Uh, we will organize this uh, also the showroom, uh, showcasing the latest innovative technologies and, uh, and in, at the same time also create a network of opportunities for the stakeholder. Hopefully, you know, this showroom, it's, it, I mean, it will be uh, not virtual, but physical, yeah. So we will, hopefully we will have uh, during for the COVID, due to COVID, some uh, possibilities to, to to invite people and people will come. 
Uh, and yes, we are planning to showcase this digital twin in 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 at, at in September of of country of Slovenia. So um, the main uh, AI event uh, will be the high level conference on 14th and 15th of September, mm -hmm. and it will be hybrid. This what we want want to be hybrid because high level uh, uh, people will will hopefully will come on site. Uh, so um, this, we believe that this conference will represent an excellent opportunity to engage and discuss, you know, with cross-border in the international community on the open questions re related to, to, to AI. Um, so, and in December, we will organize as well uh, two high-level conferences on e-government, where all the smart cities will be part of it, and on interoperability, yeah? interoperability and the CIO network uh, meeting. So both planned as, as hybrid. Uh, so I'm kindly inviting uh, all of you, uh, if you have any chances, either virtual or on-site, to come and uh, be part of these uh, conferences. They will be publicized uh, via Slovenian government web pages and also via European, uh, European Commission web pages. Mm -hmm. So thanks, and uh, Leslie, back to you. Yeah, and thank you for that kind invitation. I, uh, I feel my diary has gotten much more full for the rest of the year now. Uh, Leslie, Slovenia is a beautiful country. <laughs> uh, Leslie, may I pick up uh, one word from Peter? Yes, um, please. You said in one stream, um, smart cities and communities. And uh, this is uh, uh, very important for me. Some people are talking about smart cities and regions. And uh, although we said at the beginning that uh, uh, two thirds of the people in the future will live in urban areas, there's still one third of the people living in rural areas. And these people living in rural areas also have the right for digital solutions. Now, I'm myself living in a village of 2,000 people, um, close to a bigger city. Um, and also for people living in, in villages, it is important. And that's why I'm supporting a group of people who are trying to change the world of smart cities using, in the future, smart communities. Uh, and uh, communities integrating cities and rural areas And uh, I think it is important for us always uh, to include uh, people living in rural areas when talking about digitization for people. Mm. Thank you. Ulrich, and if I may uh, re reply, yeah? uh, as I mentioned, uh, Slovenia is uh, mostly rural, you know. Ljubljana is biggest town with 300,000 uh, people, for example. Yeah? Mm. And this is especially important, what you mentioned, for, for Slovenia. And the people living in the in the villages, yeah, and small towns, yeah. Thanks. And if I may, also, we we tend to forget that uh, uh, when we move to these uh, digital advanced digital infrastructures, is not only for cities. So the uh, Internet of the future, so providing gigabit, uh, uh, you know, uh, bandwidths, etc., is not only for cities. It really is for smart communities. I cannot agree more. Uh, uh, with uh, with uh, uh, actually with Ulrich on this, so it is there where we are heading towards. We should not create uh, in this digital decade that we announced a new sort of divide between cities and communities. It's absolutely necessary that we move all together to be able to cover widely. Uh, so uh, the uh, not only from an internet perspective, but from modern technology perspective all these cities and communities at the same time and to not leave anybody out of it. Otherwise, we would have really, uh, I, I think, missed or lost the opportunity of doing something at this level. Mm -hmm. And it's not only about smart, actually. It's really about basic infrastructures that need to be promoted everywhere, in every area, in every region, in uh, every part, corner of Europe, actually. Mm -hmm. It's a very yeah. good remark. Yeah, And there's, there's an interesting... A survey of the German Bitkom, it's the organization of uh, German telco and IT companies, um, asking people where they would like to live if home office would be also possible in the future once Corona is gone. And 35% of, uh, of the people and a lot of young people said, I would move into the green area, uh, so uh, into the, the rural area, away from the city, if I could work from home continuously. Hmm? Mm. And for this, we need 
a solid digital infrastructure. Agreed. Thank you very much for your remarks, gentlemen. Uh, I would like to uh, transition to a question that came in uh, from chat uh, directly for Mr. Viana. Um, the question is, urbanization is closely related to the three dimensions of sustainable development, economic, societal, and environmental. And all of these affect smart city planning strategies. Uh, in your opinion, what will be the main or major shifts in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic? Uh, I absolutely agree with the previous <laughs> intervention. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, I think this, this is one of the subjects that we don't know how will be uh, the post-COVID, but there are lots of good things that we learn uh, and we perhaps we can take advantage of. Uh, and uh, it, it, I hope COVID is a pandemic, but it's not a lost opportunity for perhaps thinking the way we were doing things before. And, uh, and, and this can change uh, the, the, the city planning and urbanization very much. And, uh, and the way we can, we can relate today, perhaps I'm in Portugal, uh, I don't know where you are in the world, but we are having this conversation and sharing thoughts. Uh, can, it's, it, for me, it's work, of course, and I'm working with you, creating something better. And uh, this, is, this was a thing that uh, was not possible before. And uh, of course, these means were available, but for instance, my team is uh, distributed for, uh, in Portugal. I have a part of the team in the north and a part of the team, uh, the team in Lisbon, the capital. And uh, what this pandemic shows, uh, showed us is that the team that was on the north, now it's a lot more participative and included on the work that we are doing. So we are, in reality, taking lots of benefits from the team that uh, we were meeting once a week, two, twice a week, uh, Having to uh, having to uh, travel, go ba going back, going forward, and now we are more productive. We are taking more advantage of their knowledge. But I would like to add another thing, uh, and that's of course we can make sure the infrastructure, the smart, is there. But we also have uh, another challenges, and the challenges they are for for from the society, for instance people that don't know how to use digital, people that know how to use digital, but they are afraid to interact with the government because sometimes there are very uh, important things that will have a very big impact on their lives. And, and this is a, a thing that also we have to, to take in consideration, planning how we are providing digital services, while we are thinking smart cities, and one of the things that we are doing in Portugal for several years, because we have this very big advantage of having an older population that was not, uh, who didn't study a lot and is not aware, or not, that doesn't have the means sometimes for using digital services. We put in place in the last years a, a network of 1,000 uh, citizen spots. Uh, it, it is a place where he, he, uh, uh, anyone can go and uh, get digital assisted uh, assisted digital services with a, a citizenship mediator that ensures that the, the, the seniors, the less educated are able, and the ones that don't have means for having IT or communications in the home, have access to digital services and can do the service with help of someone. And, and in some of the, and this is a partnership between the cities, the, local, the, the regions, the communities, and for instance, the, this, in this case, uh, central governments, ensuring that everyone is able to take advantage of this transformation. And this is the thing that also we have to take in consideration alongside uh, also uh, uh, with uh, regard uh, problems regarding accessibility and usability of digital services. Yeah. 
Well said. Accessibility is a is a near and dear topic to my heart. Thank you very much for that. Um, uh, to our kind friends at OFE, I think we have time for one more question, but if I could get a confirmation in chat that we uh, have time for one more, that would be wonderful. And while I'm waiting for you, we do, excellent, that was rapid. Okay, so then I think uh, the final question that I would like to pose is, um, uh, Mr. Ali, given your uh, global perspective on smart cities through the FireWare initiative, can you talk to us a little bit about what you think is of are the global uh, outlook for smart cities and perhaps also some comments on how uh, the global outlook for smart cities may also play a part in discussions of e EU policy. Well, I think the the example I uh, gave on uh, uh, from India is uh, a very good uh, example and this is this was just an example. Um, we have uh, several uh, several similar sorry similar initiatives in uh, Japan, for example, we have uh, starting activities uh, in the US and here definitely Red Hat, which is one of the uh, partners here of this program and making this uh, event a uh, reality is uh, definitely um, helping us also in, in the US. And uh, there was one question in the chat how the, the partnership of Fiverr and uh, Red Hat um, works. Red Hat joined us um, quite recently last year, uh, identifying the, the potential of um, the open source technology in the Fiverr ecosystem, the standards which were created. And uh, here we are also transferring it uh, to, uh, to the US. But the main, the main two elements from my perspective, and these are more and more recognized on the global scale, are what is called in in uh, in this open and agile smart cities community MIM1 standard APIs MIM2 standard data models, and these are the main levers to um, create um, uh, reusability of solutions, be it open source or be it closed source, um, and finally to avoid that the wheel is invented several times and finally to spend also public funding and public money most efficiently thank you mr gershak mr viana do you have anything that you would like to add to that uh, <laughs> yes, I guess. Let's go, Pedro. no no i i i fully agree uh, it's a it's a major uh, preoccupation on on portuguese government is that uh, what we are doing can be shared, can re be replicated, can be, uh, can we can scale and make available to to, other, to others, and mo uh, and mostly because there are different levels, uh, not only on central government but also uh, on local and, and communities on on how to deal with IT technology, smart, and. Uh, it's it's a great pleasure uh, pleasure that uh, I see that for instance, the 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 guiding practices on smart cities they of course they have the uh, strong presence from the, the big cities in Portugal and big communities but uh, they are competing with other uh, cities and communities that are uh, less developed perhaps not the, the best word but that they want to attract. Uh, people they want to provide best, better services and for uh, perhaps I think these cities are leading this uh, this way so uh, it, it's uh, I, I think that uh, we have to co-create this uh, this evolution uh, with citizens with central local gov government with businesses and, and entrepreneurs and uh, I would like to reinforce this, this, this we have to co-create because the uh, last uh, version of Smart Cities was not perhaps co-created. And I think for su uh, success, we'll have to listen to everyone and put the input and in making sure the city is serving the people, the businesses that are living on, on this community. Mm. Thank you. If, if may I add, I would... Uh comment the, the Pedro mentioned digital divide and the, those who are digitally excluded um, and uh, maybe just to share 
we have in Slovenia, we have project uh, called Symbiosis, and these are volunteers. Uh, actually, uh, we can say grandchildren are teaching or digital skills elderly people, and they are volunteering. So I think this is a great example how we can, in a nice way, uh, bridge this digital uh, divide. And we, we, you know, we can create whatever kind of smart solutions. If people will not be able to use it, then it's it's a waste of money. It's a waste of time. So that would be kind of my thought uh, that we have to really take care for the for the end users. Yeah. Great. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, very much for joining us and sharing uh, all of your wisdom and your perspectives and your lived experience and uh, the experiences of. Uh, of your homelands. Um, kind friends from Open Forum Europe, I'm sure you probably have some closing housekeeping remarks that you would like to make. So I'll go ahead and return the floor to Aster. And uh, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, and there will be a video of the event later if you would like to recommend it to your friends to watch. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Hi, Aster. Hi, I think I accidentally muted uh, one of the panelists instead of unmuting myself. Can you hear me now? We can hear you. Okay, that's nice. Well, thank you everyone. Um, and thank you all panelists and thank you Leslie for moderating. Um, yeah, so so uh, this was, as I said, the first uh, installment of our series uh, on policy. So we will have and communicate to all of you uh, um, further invitations. I think the next one is going to be, uh, or I know for a fact that the next one is going to be on uh, open source program offices in uh, um, outside of the private sector. So covering governments, uh, universities and NGOs as a vehicle to uh, really achieve uh, open source policy goals at scale. So of course, a lot of overlap to, to cities and, and uh, um, public administrations as well. Um, you know, with that, we will communicate everything and we will also give you, of course, a link uh, of the recording and share it with everyone. So for now, thank you very much for attending. And again, thank you all of you who participated in the panel. I hope we talk soon. Thank you. Thank you.